on, to, on today's friend. They were very, very lucky to have Peter Smith, that said gentleman here, dressed for the part, he's a <laughs> um, to talk about seals and beavers. Now, my first thought when I read that as a title was, what do they have in common? But I'm guessing I might know that a bit later. A bit, a bit later One thought so. <laughs> <laughs> now, Peter is currently the uh, manager of Mandan's Wood, uh, has been for nearly a year. But before that, when I did my very brief bit of internet biography searching, this, this man has been involved in conservation for a mighty long time and, not, and actively involved at that. Uh, on YouTube, there are a number of very amusing videos of Peter seemingly gallivanting across Europe. Looking, looking to try and pick up beavers. He's, he's got four male beavers in, in the back of the van, and they're now trying to find a female. You wouldn't want to be her if you found her, would you? So, so, so that, that's, that, that's amazing. Peter, for 18 years, was the, the founder and the chief executive officer of uh, Wildwood, so very into rewilding the nature. Another side of Peter, which may or may not come out, but he's very got very clear views on um, what you can do in terms of the economy being set up in the best way for nature. And I think I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I don't think you think it's in the right place at the moment. So land value tax is a key word, but being an election period, that's quite enough of that, and I'll step back very quickly. None of the parties would support land value tax, <laughs> even so, though it is by far the best policy right. to protect nature and alleviate poverty. Yes. So, now Peter's recording this by his own use, the camera is not taking in any of the audience, so, and yes, nothing me. Mr Smith, thank you very much indeed. Well thank you. <laughs> and uh, thank you for the invite, you poor souls, putting up one of my talks. Come on. So, this talk is a combination of two talks which I said, so I will have to rattle for you a bit of it, and I've taken out all the fun videos, but we're gonna talk about beavers, and we're gonna talk about pinnipeds um, of Sussex. And I've had to do a lot of work on, on seals. Now, I'm going to refer to common seals as harbour seals. I apologize, but normally I have an international audience and the rest of the world calls them harbour seals. It's only in Britain we call them common seals. So do excuse me. Because a lot of the, you know, scientific literature, you use harbour seal. Okay, so my apologies. So, at Mally Dams, we rescue little baby seals from all over the region. And Ash there is one of our top seal handlers. She knows how to handle seals so you don't get bitten. You don't want to get bitten. They've got a um, mycoplasma bacteria that doesn't respond to antibiotics. So you've got to only, you can only use tetracyclines because um, it's complicated. Yeah, I can bore you with the details, but my first degree was medical biochemistry. So I could give you a five hour lecture on all these things, but I won't. Um, so and the other lady there is Anna, our vet nurse. So we run around rescuing seals amongst lots of different wildlife. And we nurse them back to health. We teach them to feed. We teach them to swim in our pools. And then we go and release them again. And there's an excellent success rate. So Mali Dams is all about saving wildlife that can be saved. Okay, so not all wildlife can be saved. And over many, many decades, the RSPCA has developed the knowledge to do that. And we have got uh, a fantastic team of knowledgeable people, vets, vet nurses, wildlife assistants, um, who can do that. And it is a true honor to work with them. And that's the end result, a happy little common scene um, that gets released. And we do that along the beach here. And we also release them elsewhere if we've caught them from elsewhere. So, so where, do, where do seals come from? Well, if we look at our phylogenetic trees and go back 45 million years ago, that was the first common ancestor of the seal. And that is Pugilia. And it looks pretty fearsome there, but actually it was a really small otter-like creature that lived in uh, North Canada. And then it spent life 
20 million years, swimming around, doing not much, but then they, they went to the sea and, and then the Arctus came about and that started swimming, a bit like a, a little sea otter really. And that then turned into a seal. So you've got three groups. You've got your uh, full seals without ears. That's what the Latin means. Then you've got your sea lions, you've got little ears. And then all on its own, the walrus has got their own little phylogenetic branch. And that's what we've got today. So one of the big questions I've been researching lately was what's the historic populations of seals? And it's very hard. I've read about ooh, 400 scientific papers that mention populations. And my own background in conservation and genetic, genetic and population modeling, I've read the papers. Now, there's not a lot of evidence. The evidence so far say somewhere between 350 thousand years ago and two million years ago is the gray seal we know today and the first fossil remains in Europe was about 17,000 years ago in the Dordogne I'll have a little slide why that might be the case a little later and the other question that's hot on there is a political hot potato is how big were the population nobody knows could have been millions. But what we can do with genetics is learn about it's a, what's known as its effective population size. You can calculate that. It's not real population size. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of um, scientific thought. But we know where there was glacier maxima, they nearly all died out. So they went through a number of genetic bottlenecks. So what affected their populations historically? Glaciation, predation, wolves, bears, orcas, lots of wolves and bears would predate on them. Um, there was prehistoric and medieval exploitation, but it wasn't a huge factor on their numbers. So I like to call this the triumph of the commons. When, when nature was kept as a common property, you find people protect it. When it becomes private property, it is exploited mercilessly. And that's what we've got with the tragedy of the non-commons is total exploitation after 1600 and the numbers start dropping. With gray seals, they virtually went extinct. Industrial harvesting and systematic, even after industrial harvesting, even when gray seals stopped being an economic resource, we still wanted to kill them all because we're stupid humans. So, gray seal populations, they are a continental shelf specialist. They like to swim out on the continental shelf where they mostly eat um, crabs, shellfish, and sand eels. Biggest part of their diet is sand eels. Um, and that's a speciality on the continental shelves around Newfoundland, Iceland, the Nordic, and the British coasts. Harbour seals have got a very similar distribution, but they are specialists, as you all know. You've got a harbour population, uh, harbour seal population here, and they specialise in estuaries, and that's but over the same sort of area. Now, what happened during these glacier maxima is we had Doggerland, the whole of Britain and the North Sea, and some of the channel always was all land. So the seals couldn't access the continental shelf. The sea was too deep. And as a specialist, they couldn't survive. So over the years, but thanks to the artificial intelligence, I've been able to go back in time and get a picture of them living back then. Or at least that's what chat GPT or whatever it's called thinks happened there. And of course, medieval man lived in perfect harmony with seals. So we can see that, uh, the, the, isn't it amazing what artificial intelligence can do? But those are the, uh, that's our climate over the last half a million years, the glacier maxima, and that correlates with these rapid crashes of population and rise of population of the seals. But there's one population graph that we really should worry about, and that's this one, because that's humans. That's the one that really 
has caused the demise of the seal. And the gray seals only survived because they were able to hang out in very inaccessible islands far north of Scotland, Greenland. They were literally hunted to extinction, probably less than 5,000 left in the entire world by the turn of the last century. And just as the great orc was hunted to absolute extinction. And this comes back to the point I always raise that man, when he can make a buck, he will make a buck. It's as simple as that. And if that means nature goes tough, it's going to go. And it's that process that drove the great orc to extinction and the gray seal nearly to extinction. So we had a near extinction event. What's happened since then? And why? Well, we've got a standard population graph. Now, a lot of this data is not perfect. I will be the first to admit that. Recent data is very good, but the data, but we've had the worldwide population of gray seals has followed the standard population curves. The data for around Sussex and the channel's not very good, and I can't really use it in a graph. It's not there. But if we go to the Wadden Sea over by Denmark, which is very similar in many ways, we can see that the gray seals never appeared um, until about the 1980s, when they started coming back from up north. And their populations are rising quite rapidly. And harbor seals, common seals, they are pretty steady. And then we had two sawtooths. And now these population crashes were due to the distemper virus. And it mostly affects harbor seals because your common harbor seal, it lives in estuaries and it's, it's, it's epidemiologically um, naive. It is a small population that doesn't meet other seals. So it can go for a, a generation or two without getting exposed to the distemper virus. And this distemper virus has been tracked back in time, um, at least to the 1500s, you know, in dogs and seals, it's been happening. It normally comes around from the Arctic, where it lives in things like harp seals, but occasionally it will come to Britain. And when you've got a population that's now naive, that have not been exposed to that disease, they are susceptible to having a huge population. And you can have a 50% loss of population. So that's a worry because we're getting to the time where it should happen again. If you do your epidemiology, if you study wildlife disease and wildlife ecology. So we've got to be very careful of that while the gray seal shooting up. If we look at the other population data, this shows these population crashes of the harbor seal now. They don't measure, the government body doesn't measure the populations around Sussex, but it does measure around Kent up to the Wash. But gray seal numbers are absolutely shooting up, and this is causing the problem, which I'll talk about in a minute. If we look what's happening off the French coast, exactly the same with gray seals, and off the Dutch coast, exactly the same. So we're going to start seeing a lot more gray seals and you will see a few gray seals now. Now, if you study population modeling, genetics, whatever, you always see these sigmoidal curves. They're always the same. You start off low, you get your fast growth, and then things slow down. Something stops their populations expanding, be that food, disease, and we're getting problems where in some areas we are reaching that level. Um, this is the latest data uh, that's published by uh, the government body, um, the experts, seal expert group. And these little triangles um, for gray seals, this is pup production as opposed to population modeling, are showing rises all over. On our coast, they just don't take the number, so we, we don't know exactly what's going on but certainly anecdotally there is a lot more seals so mostly you've got your harbor seals here 
And then if you go down the coast towards Hastings, you start getting your um, grey seals. Now, they're not breeding groups yet. Um, they're not proper colonies as such. Certainly for the grey seals, they're just haul out sites where they're resting because grey seals fly off and travel hundreds of miles feeding while harbour seals just hang around the harbour. And that's the population trends in uh, harbour seals. Now, as you can see, population numbers are starting to drop around Iceland, um, uh, Shetlands, Orkneys, all that kind of stuff. And it's not, this one's not because of the distemper virus. This is because they are, they, they've reached their population maxima and density dependent diseases, lungworms, other ailments are starting to affect them. Predators are coming in, orcas, and gray seals. So this is supposedly my area of expertise is, is population ecology. When we think about seals, there's been a huge fight over the years saying that they take fish, and they do, they eat fish. But they don't eat fish that affects the overall population of fish. And that's pretty much proved now. But what happens when you go and kill a seal? You government persuades themselves that they have to mount a seal cull. So they are a top predator. Seals are the wolves of the sea. And when you take them away, you cause a cascade through whole populations. And there's been some great examples seen where they've done seal culls. Over in British Columbia, they had had to get, they had a, you know, the fishermen um, wanted to kill the seals. They did. And they thought that killing the seals would mean they could fish more salmon. No, it doesn't work like that. Nature never works like that always much more complicated because the population of Haig vastly increased and they ate all the salmon smolts which virtually wiped out the salmon and this is why we should never enter into coals without proper knowledge. Another example of the complex ecology of seals is, seals have actually done quite well in the last hundred years where they haven't been persecuted for man. And that's because we persecuted the whales. When all the whales were removed, the krill entered new food webs. And that helped penguins in the south and seals in the north. And a number of populations rose. And one of the biggest problems we've got is the food webs that, that have now appeared that eat krill are preventing krill forming the mass that allows whale numbers to re-establish. So instead of whale numbers establishing quickly because persecution stopped, it's now going to take hundreds of years for whale numbers to come back because the food webs have changed. And the food webs are so complicated. I could spend hours trying to explain the food webs. It's not better because having whales, you know, all that whale poo, what they do forms their own ecological communities and that's died. And we've had new ecological communities arise, which has favored the seals, the food webs, krill, fish, seals. So, we have to be very careful when we mess around with nature. Another example that is well documented is in the Copper River Delta in Alaska. Again, bloody salmon farmers. And they keep saying that now, you know, all of the salmon farmers up in, um, um, up in Northumberland are always salmon farmers, not the salmon farmers. The salmon farmers still shoot salmon, appallingly. Uh, the salmon farmers still shoot seals. But they've also been calls, many calls for the, to get rid of seals because it affects their salmon and they think they're the problem. But really, a lot of these people are only masking the true problem. The true problem is for salmon is we've destroyed our rivers, we've polluted them, 
you don't have good ecology, uh, ecologically diverse uplands that keep streams clean, and that's why salmon numbers are going down. But if you do go and shoot all the seals, again, you had a system where the starry flounder started, numbers started going up because you got rid of the seals, they all ate all the clams, and the clam fishing and the salmon fishing collapsed again. So shooting seals for your fish is a stupid idea, one that's happened many, many times, and it's never worked, but yet they still are doing it, even today. The other interesting thing about seals is their relationship with kelp. Now, the kelp beds of England have been decimated, and we should have a lot of kelp along the south coast, which would create a fantastic community of amazing, the benthic flora and fauna would, but we're not getting it, it's gone. Now, yes, it's pollution, yes, it's destructive um, fishing, dragging the bottoms, but the missing piece of the jigsaw is it's the seals eat the things that eat kelp and stop it establishing, just like in the California kelp beds with the sea otters. So we need our seals back, because if all these seals do come back, maybe our kelp forests will return. They will sequester a million ton of carbon, having the kelp beds back on Sussex coast, maybe 20 million, who knows? It's ginormous, the amount of carbon that it'll do. It'll be fantastic for our community. So, history of human conflict. Lots of fishermen spent 100 years saying they're eating our fish when all the real population analysis showed they weren't. They do affect inshore fishing here, but again, it's a scapegoat for industrial fishing, taking all our fish. And, and it's, it's land management for trout and salmon that many of the people who own the fishing rights are landowners themselves and they don't want to be seen as responsible for getting rid of the salmon and trout fishing. But that's what used to happen. For a hundred years, there's been a battle going on between people who wanted to shoot seals and it's still going on today in Scotland. They're still shooting seals. It's absolutely disgusting. There is a history of the um, various acts that were brought in. The first um, um, wildlife protection bill for mammals was the seal. So that battle's been going on between, you know, people who wanted to look after seals and the fishermen all this time, and it's still going on today. So we've got a new threat. So when I got to Mallee Dams, Um, yes, there is a new threat, but let me um, talk first. The threats we've got, the future of seals, we've got to keep an eye out for the porcine distemper virus. That is a real problem. And so keep your eyes peeled for seals in distress and give us at Mali Dams a call if you do. We're seeing a lot more density dependent diseases, lung worms and other things coming in. And we're, we're trying to um, monitor that. The food availability for seals is actually going up because the biggest issue is um, our little sand eels. I think there's five species of sand eels around here. And they were factory farmed. And the European legislation that's evolved over the last 50 years was to have certain closed seasons for fishing. And the latest legislation looks like it's gonna ban fishing because it just goes to fish meal. You know, it's not, a, it's not something people eat. It's not a commercial species. But that is the biggest determining factor on uh, seal numbers, is sand eels, more than any of the other fish species. So that's good news for seals. So, there's been a lot of press stories lately that seals are causing the devastation of local fishers, I believe. I've got to get my woke uh, vocabulary right. It's fishers now. And the fishermen 
And I've met the fishermen, they're lovely people. I've got nothing, they really are. The people who come out of Rye Harbour and do fishing, they're nice people. And I've met them, had a few meetings with them, but they have perpetrated a lot of false information. They have blamed poor old our Mali dams for releasing all the seals. They were never here before we started doing it. We've been importing them from Wales and chucking them out into the rivers. It's all our fault. And they say, oh, and because we put little tags on them, that means they get caught in our fishing gear and they die. We're evil, right? So there's some very nasty PR. The tags pull straight out if they ever get caught. But there's a lot of seals get caught in fishing gear. Unfortunately, we've also had questions in Parliament by our local MP who is advocating for a seal kill. Now, I've now met Sally Ann twice and talked her through all the issues and she's, she's you know, calmed herself down a bit because she was believing some of the um, tall tales of our, our local fishers. And um, she's probably not going to be, uh, can't talk party politics. Anyway. A couple of weeks time, a few weeks time. Yeah. <laughs> it might not be a problem that it is now. But actually, she's a little, it's like all politicians, they have to pretend to be party political. But when you meet them and talk to them, they, they, they're okay. Politics, a strife of interests masquerading as a contest of principle. My famous political quote. Um, so she's backed off a little from that. But she really was pushing and asking questions and pushing towards some kind of seal control, which I'm very much against, as you can imagine. I've been working with some people at Oxford University on this problem of how seals interact with um, fishers and the negative effects. And I've been working with some other people on how can we resolve these problems. It's really complicated. I can bore you with it. And obviously, the biggest, one of the biggest threats to seals now is getting trapped in fishing gear. Um, a study in Finland showed 20% of uh, seals were dying due to fishing gear, which is a phenomenal amount. So, core issues, seals do not, seals definitely do damage fishermen's nets right in shore. The little guys, not many of them who go out fishing in shore, their nets are definitely being damaged by gray seals, not so much harbor seals. And they're clever. Seals pose no risk to fish stocks whatsoever. Gray seals are native. They weren't imported here. They used to live here in abundance until we killed them all. And now they're returning back to natural population. Gray seals return to the South East Coast naturally. They, they travel huge distances, you know, they swim over to Denmark and to Holland and over to France and then they come back on their little journeys. And um, seals are killed in fishing nets, but not because of any tags or monitoring equipment we're using, right? They just pull straight out. What's the future? Where should we go? What should we do? Two things. We want to try and support and that's why I've had some meetings with fishermen to try and um, see if we can help get funding to look at seal safe fishing gear and systems. There's a number of types of different nets. There's a number of types of uh, deterrents you can try and use uh, to stop seals plundering the local nets. And this is a problem that goes all over um, Sweden and Denmark. It's not just Britain. And there's people developing these systems. And the other thing, the thing that saved the, sea, the gray seals of Northumberland, where I come from, was the local fishing industry uh, found out they could make more money by taking people out on boats to see the seals. And they became far more vocal critics. And back in the 50s and 60s, that's what's, you know, the, one of the, biggest things that happened at the Farne Islands, and I used to work on the Farne Islands for the National Trust when I was a young conservationist, just sitting out. And so I had all the stories, and although you had all these, you know, bunny huggers, it was, the, it was those commercial realism. Where's your cheese? Where's the money? Right? It always beats where the heart. If the money lies in the right place, you will find people will do the right thing. If the money lies in the wrong place, they will do the wrong thing. 
And so the economics of tourism really saved the seals. And I think that's what we should all do here is support efforts to have more uh, seal watching, boats going out, create employment, and just what you're doing here is to promote the enjoyment of sealing and doing that in a safe way that doesn't disturb the seal. So, we've also got something else in our future. They're not quite the top predator of seals, are they? There's another top predator bigger than the seals. And we're seeing gradual and statistically certain more sightings of orcas in the channel. So give it 10, 20 years, and you're going to have a few orcas swimming off the coast around here. Right. So I promised to do two talks, combine them into one. And the other one is the, the beaver story of the area. And my career has been very much linked with beavers, as you can know. I've been um, an advocate for beaver reintroduction. And it all came about because of John McAllister. And anybody know John McAllister? He's the man. So back in 1980, no, 1998, I was freshly um, got a job at Kent Wildlife Trust. And John was their reserve manager. And we became very good because we're both nerdy ecologists. You know, we're really into deep ecology. And we started doing rewilding stuff. We imported wild horses to look after nature reserves. You had some here for a while, uh, some of the conics. Um, we started buying larger nature reserves because I've got a bit of a gift of the gab and I started raising a lot of money for Kent Wildlife Trust. They had a lot of money. And we started doing some big stuff and we were looking at a ham fed, the nature reserve. And at the time, this beautiful nature reserve wasn't like that. It was drying out. Peat basin, all the farmers pumping all the water out, and then the peat basin shrinks. So you think you can pump the water out of a peat basin. Uh, uh, more you, guess what happens if you pump the water out of a peat basin? The soil oxidizes and claps, so you're still wet. You can keep on pumping, it just goes down and down and down and down. So pumping water out of a peat basin Sounds like a good idea, because then people can farm it arably. But actually, it's a stupid idea. But it was destroying all the peat. And so this nature reserve, all the peat was oxidizing. All that carbon dioxide going in the atmosphere. All the rare plants were dying. And I went down to this nature reserve with John McAllister. And we were both nerdy, as I said. And he said, wouldn't it be great if we had some beavers here? Because at the time, we were paying a huge amount of money at the time to scrape the mineralized peat using giant earth scrapers to try and expose the soil to save the plants that this was designated as a triple SI4. It's madness, sheer madness. And we could get some beavers. But it was a pipe dream. Nobody was going to allow us. The government weren't going to allow us. Um, the trustees of Kent Wildlife Trust certainly weren't going to allow us. Um, and so that pipe dream sat for a year. And then I was down. Um, I set up a, a, a scheme with um, Robert Brett and Sons, if you know them. They are the aggregates company. And the, this thing called landfill tax, not land value tax, landfill tax. And I set up their landfill tax, and we had to go down and meet one of the owners. And I took um, John McAllister down because he, well, they wanted to talk about his garden and found a dormouse. And over that kitchen table, he asked us what we'd like to fund, and we told him the beaver project. And he, he happened to have a, a dredger called the beaver, and he said, right, I'll pay for that one. Three weeks later, 250 grand check in the post to us. And then about three months later, another 250 grand check. 
And how could the trustees refuse it? So we set up the Beaver Project. And I could talk for hours on how people in DEFRA tried to stop us all of the complex issues they tried to, um, legal issues, the, the madness of some of the people involved, the battles behind the scenes with the trustees. But because me and John were utterly pig-headed and driven, we pushed it through. And then for many years, Kentwell Atras didn't want to talk about it that much. But now rewilding has flourished. Of course, it's all fantastic. And when we then quarantined the first beaver, when we went off to Norway to get the first beaver and quarantined them back, we quarantined them at what was before Wildwood Trust, and that was going to go out of business. So I decided I'll start a charity, take it over, and run it as a rewilding conservation charity, because that was my thing. And so that's how I got involved with it. But beaver really do change the landscape, utterly. They do amazing things. They create these little beaver ponds all the way up valleys. They create diverse habitats, sucking in carbon, creating deep peaty soils. They're just amazing. They create all the complexity, the ruderal nature, the, the slopes and the micro habitats that you just don't get anywhere else. Britain used to be 25% affected by beavers. All of our nature evolved to live in harmony. There's so many plants and trees that have evolved to live in a beaver modified habitat. And that's why having beavers is so important. They can restore streams. You go from a desiccated dry stream, which is happening in streams in Sussex, they'll start building their dams, they'll braid the channels, they'll create complex wetlands. And that purifies the water stops silt going down it creates it stops flooding it's it's just amazing there's no downside to having beavers so recently in the last few years you've had some beavers released uh, by the national trust and charlie over at net but the first beaver was here over near sandwich at hamfet um and that was 2001. And they've slowly started expanding. And you've now got beavers all the way through the star catchment. The first beaver may have wandered over to the rother. It's going to take another 15 years for them to fill out the rother catchment. And then a little more time before they get to Mali down. But your future as a beaver future. They're also going to jump over into the Medway. It'll take just as long for these beaver numbers to rise and become, and it's, it's not an easy for them to jump into other catchments, unfortunately. Um, but the beavers here will eventually fill the Medway, get over into the Mole, the Darrant, and the Way, and our future is a beaver future. They've got legal protection. We just have to let them live. Need a few more beavers for to have a good genetic uh, mix. We're still, we, the, due to a horrible disease called a Echinococcus multilocularis, they stopped us importing beavers. Um, I will not mention the person in question, but somebody managed to give a then environment minister a beaver with said disease to release. And then they all had to quickly shuffle away and try and hide that it happened. Um, but that's when you have people who aren't quite knowledgeable doing beaver reintroductions um, without the right vets and all that kind of stuff. There's a beaver we rescued at Mallee Dams just a few months ago, two months ago. So what happens is so many beavers now down in the sour that the youngsters two years old, leaving the lodge, go off for a little swim. And some of them swim down and out to sea and they get stranded and they start breathing in a bit of water, their kidneys start failing, and then they get in really bad way. So we've had about five beavers that needed rescuing this year. And so we can run around, grab the beaver, rehydrate it, check it's all right. And then you've got to go through an enormously complicated legal process 
to reintroduce you know, said thing, but you can get the licenses. Uh, it takes about three weeks to go through the paperwork and all the testing to make sure it doesn't have a Kynococcus multilocularis. Say that after a few sherbets. But what's beavers going to do for this area? Well, beavers, fantastic study in Canada, in salt marshes and habitats moving towards uh, salt, beavers create little dams and they know where the fresh water is infiltrating in. And they will actually create dams that actually increase or decrease the salination of that area. So you get far more little micro habitats. Not only will they breed more channels and make more complexity, but in areas that's not too saline, they will actually take up residence and start changing the habitat, making it much more diverse. So that's what's going to happen when you have beavers here. Ain't going to happen 15 for 20 years. And they, this isn't ideal habitat, so they'll have to, you know, sort of get bored with some other places before they move in. But the other thing they do is the benthic community. All those little creatures at the bottom of the sea and the bottom of rivers. Beavers are going to take out the sediments. They're going to take out pollutants. They're going to make the water quality better. And that means you're going to have a much greater diversity. Combine that with a few seals, and you're going to have a much more interesting seabed in the future. Give it 50 years. If we allow beavers to populate all the river robber and the whole catchment, and they will create a far happier seabed out to sea and in the estuary. The other thing beavers do is we forget when we talk about global warming, where's most of the carbon that interacts with the environment? It's not actually the sea. Even though the sea deep down has got huge amounts of carbon, it's actually only a very small amount at the surface of the sea that interacts with the atmosphere. By far, the most active store of carbon is our soils. We're losing the soils all over. We're draining the soils we're all over the world. We're draining soils. We're, that's where most, a lot of the modeling isn't very good, but I suspect that the loss of soil is a far higher contribution, a contributory factor to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than fossil fuels. But it's not talked about. And the only thing on a large scale that will reverse the process of oxidation of soils on a ginormous level in Britain is the beaver. I have done some uh, little modeling myself and the beavers, if allowed to occupy 30% of the uh, waterways of the UK, would sequester about the same amount of carbon as what humans produce in the UK. So I haven't been, um, I've been busy boy at Mally Dams, so I can't just run the place. I've also created a new charity called the uh, Future Landscapes Trust with some fantastic local landowners. And we are going to, we've just won £400,000 from our friends at the Environment Agency, as well as getting some private sponsorship. We've set up this new charity and we're going to start putting in beaver structures because we can't wait until the beavers get here. Haven't got 15 years. 20 years. So we're going to start habitat management. And all because pet levels flooding. It flooded last year and it will flood again, even though the statistics say it shouldn't flood. But we're getting more and more flooding. It's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And one of the reasons is now some people say we're getting more rainfall. Don't think so. Not the statistics. Now we are having clustering effects of the rainfall. That means more, you know, heavier downpours for a few days. But we're not getting more rainfall. The statistics don't think it says that. But the big thing is all these changes on the land, factory farming, building drainage ditches, the water rushes straight off the land, straight down the streams, straight into the villages and towns at the bottom of the streams, cause flooding. So our job is to analyze the water flows in the Marsham sewer and look at the peak flows and then can we do things in the valley to flatten that curve to the point where the village doesn't flood, attenuate the flow. 
And we've done, because we've just getting a huge stack of money, we've got a fantastic group of hydrologists and fluvial geomorphologists to come in and model every raindrop, where it goes, how fast it goes, and where best we can do restore, just like what beavers would do, we're going to restore the woodland at Mallee Dams and all our neighboring land. Hold on. There we go. I'll use the thing. So Mallee Dams is up here. And we've got Hoodwood and Stony Link Wood. And we've got all these landowners, quite a lot of them, to agree to create essentially a giant nature reserve. Get rid of all the horrible rhododendron that's infesting the woodlands. Start building up wet woodland, peaty woodlands, wooded heath on the drier, higher slopes. All the habitats where the vegetation stops the water flowing fast. It creates the organic soils that suck that water in. And if we do that, we can prove, hopefully, we can stop pet level from flooding. So that's going to occupy my time for the next three years, achieving that. So thank you. And uh, questions?